Happy 2021, everyone, and welcome to the newly branded podcast, The Player's Experience. I know it's a little confusing because I still got this banner hanging, but the banner hasn't come in yet. Um, over the holidays, I wasn't able to get it set up, so it will be in the show for next week, so stay tuned for that new banner. But until then, we have a very exciting guest to kick off the 2021 season of the show. Three-time Olympian uh, Kyle Schufelt will be on the show to talk about his gymnastics career, how it all got started, uh, his work ethic, his determination to get to three Olympic uh, competitions, and some important people that led him on the way and on the path to that success. Of course, I would like to give a shout out to our production team, Jay Salty Photography, for all the work that they do on the production side of things. Um, also, too, guys, remember my codes for Hush Blankets and the Great North Apparel are still active. Hit up the link in my bios. Uh, on Instagram and Twitter to be able to get some great quality um, goods with a discounted price as well. And thank you for to both of those guys for their partnership on the show as well. So without further ado, let's get Kyle on the show and start off this brand new podcast. All right, Kyle, how's it going, man? Going good. Thanks for having me on the show, right? No problem. It's been a while since we've last seen each other. Last time, I think, was uh, 2018 Special Olympics Canada Gala in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, what have you been up to since then? <laughs> you know. Uh, outside, just, of uh, outside of COVID. Yeah, right outside of COVID. I think we're all in the depths of COVID right now. But, you know, I, I have a daughter. She's going to be five in January. So I spent a lot of time hanging out with her and um, just trying to fill my life with that, that joy that a kid can bring and really over the past couple of years since we've seen each other I've just been so happy to be at home raising my family and and, and growing my business that's incredible man um, and we're gonna talk about your business because I want to hear how that's been going um, but I want to get into like your career and how things got started um, so when you were growing up you you played hockey to at the start you know good old Canadian boy playing some hockey but then you turned to gymnastics what was the story behind changing from the rink to the gym for you? Well, when I was a, a little boy, my dad actually played for the Brandon Wheat Kings. So he was WHL level player. And so I think every dad who played hockey wants his little boys to play hockey. So my brother and I learned to skate when we were really young. I think when we were two years old, we had the little, um, you know, the little skates buckled to the bottom of our boots and we'd clip along on the ice. But it wasn't my passion. It wasn't my passion place. And it was kind of, my parents had to force me to go. They had to bribe me with five cent candies and Slurpees. And I started to do cartwheels around the living room and in the backyard. And um, I was very acrobatic and I had this like natural inclination for that. So my mom put me into gymnastics on kind of a whim, like, hey, maybe this would be a good fit for this kid. And it was an instant spark. And I just felt like I had found my place. And so I did play hockey for another two years while I did gymnastics. But then when I was seven years old, um, approaching eight, my parents said, it's time to make a decision because you're starting to get conflicts with your gymnastics training and your hockey practice times. And so I chose gymnastics and I think I made the right choice. I still love hockey. I still like to watch it, but it's not, uh, it's not a sport that like, I felt this drive and this passion for. Yeah, I totally get that. I mean, with me, I can't skate with craps. Me skating, it takes like five minutes to do a loop around the rink. So I, I was never able to get into ice hockey. I play ball hockey, but um, that's really cool because, yeah, you definitely made the right choice and we're going to get into kind of your your big career and, and where you wound up. Um, but you started your career off by attending Calgary's National Sports School in order to finish high school, all while pursuing your Olympic plans. What was the mindset for you to try and juggle both as you just touched on uh, between making a decision between hockey and gymnastics? It's a lot to manage and especially going through school and trying to reach that Olympic level. What was it like for you? Yeah, so by the time I was in grade nine, I was 14 years old and I was traveling around the world. I was traveling to Europe to start competing against the, the youth gymnasts that were of the same level as I was and 
I was gone from school a lot and I would have to pick up the slack and the public school system is, is great, but it just doesn't, it's not there to support an athlete's journey. You know, experiments in science still go on for that two weeks that you're away and it's really hard to make up that work. So it kind of got to a point where I had to make a decision. Did I want to go to regular high school or did I want to go to a specialized school? And Calgary had a, a great option called the National Sports School where sport kind of came first and your academics were secondary. However, they were still of a high priority, but it allowed the ability for me to build my school schedule around my training. So I would then go to school in the morning or sorry, I would go to gymnastics in the morning from seven till nine. I'd go to school from nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock through till three and then leave, go to my second training session till eight o'clock. Sometimes I would leave a bit early to go to school for tutoring. There's evening tutoring. So uh, it, was, it was a specialized school. It was a bit like, uh, it was a public school, but with a bit of a private um, feel to it where you had closer relationships with your teachers. You could do assignments online. This was back in like 1998 when internet school was just starting to become a thing. So it, it was very supportive. Um, I felt like I made a lot of progress in my 10th grade. And then in my 11th grade at that school, I actually decided to pursue just pure online schooling because I was traveling a lot and I wasn't, I was commuting. It was a big commute to, to the school. So I, I, I felt like it was going to be in my better interest to just like really focus primarily on gymnastics and put school kind of on a back burner. My mother did not like that decision. But my parents were so awesome. They let me make my own choices in life. And I did get a high school diploma eventually. It just took me a little longer. That's really cool, man. Like, hey, congrats on getting that high school diploma because um, I, I know what that feeling is like, not to, on, on the sports side of thing, but I didn't uh, finish my full diploma right at high school. I had to go back and finish some courses. So I know what right. the grind's like to get that diploma and, and kind of yeah. do that. But uh, yeah. that's really cool that you were able to have that school to give you that opportunity. Yeah. Now, in 2000, you were selected for the Sydney Olympics. Um, you competed in the individual floor and vault event, but did not qualify. I know that's obviously a disappointing feeling, especially when you're working and grinding to get to that point. However, you did catch the judge's attention by what's called the Schufelt vault. Can you explain what that is and how that kind of came to be? Certainly. So the, the Schufelt vault is, it's an element performed on the vault. So you run 25 meters and then I would do a round off, which is like a cartwheel, but you land with two feet onto the springboard. So your back is facing the vaulting table. At the time it was a vaulting horse. It was a long horse. So I do a round off and then a back handspring over the vaulting horse, push off of it. When I reach the handstand position, start initiating a rotation and a flip. And I do a single flip in the laid out body position, which is a straight body with two and a half twists. So other men had performed that vault with a double twist, but no one had ever done it with a two and a half twist. So I added an extra half twist and therefore it got named in my honor. In gymnastics, there's, um, there's something called the code of points. And within that is the rules and all of the skills that you can perform. And so the shoe felt is in that code of points as the vault with a two and a half twist. That's really cool. That's so cool, yeah. man. Like to get, to get a move named after you, like that's, that's pretty neat. And uh, have you been able to see or like teach that to like the next generation of gymnasts yet or what? Well, I, I've seen a lot of athletes perform it. Um, I've definitely commentated on a lot of people doing it. On the women's side, it's called an Aminar because a woman named Simona Aminar from Romania performed it as well at the 2000 Olympics. So she got it named in the women's code of points. I got it named in the men's code of points, but I have never taught it to anybody, but it is one of the skills that, yeah, I'm very proud of it. It was one of the goals I had as an athlete was to um, get a skill named after me. It shows innovation, creativity, and it shows that you kind of push that limit and you kind of helped to evolve the sport in a way. Yeah. And that's the most important aspect. And you want to kind of leave that legacy piece behind uh, in whichever way you can really. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2004, you attended the Summer Olympics in Athens where you won your first gold medal. What was it like for you to kind of get your, your first Olympic medal, let alone it being gold? And what was that experience like for you? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to backtrack here to the 2000 Olympics where you said I didn't qualify for the finals. 
it was a very big learning experience for me as an athlete. I was very nervous. My legs were shaking. I was sweating. I felt like I was on very fast forward speed. I didn't know how to calm my nerves. I didn't quite have that competition experience. So heading into the 2004 Olympic Games, I had four more years of high level competition behind me. I had won bronze medals at the World Championships. I had won a plethora of World Cup titles. So I went into those games with a lot of pressure, expectation on my shoulders, but also a lot of confidence and a lot of um, feelings of readiness. So competing at the 2004 Olympics, when I look back, I feel like they were the dream Olympics for me. You, you always want as an athlete to head into a games being in that one of those favorite positions and then be able to actually deliver on the expectations. And I had really peeled back the layers of, of the expectation on me and realized that I had no control over anything except for the way I thought the way I prepared and the way I actually performed that routine. So it was so simple. On the outside, when you watch the Olympics on TV, it seems so complicated and scary. But when you're the athlete in that moment, standing there ready to compete, there's actually this like crazy calm that surrounds you because it's just you and your floor routine. Or for a wrestler, it's the wrestler and their opponent. Or for a speed skater, it's them and the ice. And you've just, you're so present, you're so focused, your focus is narrowed in. And I look back on those games just feeling like I was the superhero version of myself. And uh, I feel a lot, of, a lot of pride and my family was there to watch and my coach and I had worked for 16 years together for that moment. So it was really the culmination of a lifetime of work. And it, and it just so happens that it all worked out <laughs> the way that I had dreamed of for 16 years of my life laying in bed. And you know what's really cool to to add to the that whole experience is you touched on it, having your family there. That's the biggest kind of support system that obviously you have growing up. Um, and to being able to have them there to watch you win that medal is probably like the most, well, it's a priceless memory, right? It's a priceless moment and nothing will ever top that. My mom told me she watched the routine looking through her <laughs> fingers. She had them covering her eyes. And I can now know and understand that as a parent myself, the nerves that you would feel for your child being in that moment. Um, yeah, but she said she watched through the, through the cracks of her fingers and her heart was beating out of her chest because she had no control. She wasn't standing there on the floor competing. Yeah, she was just like, oh God, please don't, do, please <laughs> don't just get this done. <laughs> yes. And with routines, they're they're generally really quick, right? So it's like all that, all that anxious waiting and, and, and like just waiting and waiting and waiting mm. and then for that like quick routine and then once it's done it's like oh my god thank god yeah it's a minute my routine lasted a minute and i trained for 30 hours a week for almost my entire lifetime leading up to it for one minute of a routine so wow. yeah there's a lot a lot riding on that <laughs> yeah for sure mm -hmm. um now following up on the 2004 olympics in 2006 you led the canadian team to gold at the commonwealth games in australia how excited were you to see again your hard work and dedication from 2004 building on that experience and and perfecting your techniques rather to lead to another gold medal what was that like for you yeah, 2006 was a much different year for me than 2004 in a couple different ways so 2004 was very individual like I, we had a team at the olympic games but winning the gold medal was very much like a personal goal fulfilled and i wanted so badly after those games to help contribute to team victories for team canada we had a very strong group of athletes and a couple of young athletes that were just getting into the pool into the mix so when we headed into that 2006 commonwealth games it was in melbourne australia and it was all, all about the team goal. It wasn't about individual goals. It was about the team. It was about winning a team goal and also just building our cohesion. We had had a best ever year that year, 2006. We placed fifth as a team at the world championships in the qualifying, sixth in the final. And we were just, we were on fire. Individually, it was challenging for me at those those Commonwealth Games, to be honest, because it was the first time I was competing again in a big meet and on a podium and the big venue since i had won the olympic gold medal i took a bit of time off to travel and to do 
um, speaking and to, to, I wasn't in gymnastics training really for almost a year after the Olympic games, I would kind of dabble in and out, but this was the first one where I had actually committed to training and I felt I had a lot to prove. It's one thing to chase an Olympic dream and to chase that goal and to have, to have be the one who's chasing, but it's a completely different thing to be the one standing there who had been on the top of the podium and feel like everybody else is chasing you. It's such a different mentality where you're defending your position. And um, that was really hard for me mentally to kind of come to terms with the fact that I was now in a position of like being the one to beat rather than trying to um, conquer that, that goal. Now, it's always impressive to see, again, like you said, being the, like on the podium and being the one to beat. What kind of was your mindset or like what was your one kind of go-to um, attitude, if you will, or, or kind of like achievement, if you will, to try and stay up on top? Mm-hmm. It was coming to the realization that the result was something I had no control over. All I had control over was the actual performance and the routine. And when I would start spiraling into that place of expectation and thinking about sponsors and thinking about funding and thinking about like all the things that rode on my performances, I'd start to get myself really, I would get restricted and constricted and I couldn't relax. But where I went to the place of, okay, here's what my routine will look like and feel like if I do it right that made me feel in control because then I could show up to training and work on those details rather than thinking about all the external expectation that was now placed on my shoulders. That's incredible, man. And like, good, good for you. Cause we're going to touch about uh, another set of Olympic games that you went to in 2018 in a minute, but there is one fun question I want to ask for you that I've asked every Olympic athlete that I've been able to have on the show, um, whether it's been Patrick Chan um, Anastasia Busis, uh, or even hockey players like Jason Padolin or, or anyone else, um, where do you keep your gold medals? Where, where do you, like, some, some of them have said uh, they keep them in, like, a sock drawer. Some mm. keep them, like, in a Lululemon bag, things like that with their parents. Where are your Olympic medals kept? So my, my Olympic medal is I have a safe in my office at my house, and it's in there right now um yeah it, my daughter likes to wear it around the house she clunks it around i'm like honey don't drop it uh it's been well worn it's been well loved it's collected a lot of fingerprints for sure i have some other medals like commonwealth game medals worlds and all that stuff that my my parents have this like kind of super my dad built this vault in his garage for all of his tools because his tools got stolen once. <laughs> and so it's like under eight layers of lockdown, like you don't need an eye scan. That's the only thing you don't need. It's got like so many locks and keys and things. So that's where I keep all my other stuff. But I do feel that, you know, with an Olympic medal, it, it's, it is just a material thing. It's just, it's just a thing. It's the, the, it's the meaning behind it that really matters. And I just, I love to, to bring it to my gymnastics center or to, let kids borrow it for show and tell because there's something that um that there's an emotion that's evoked when you see an olympic medal and i know how i felt when i was a kid and i got to see mark tewksbury his gold medal i got to see katrina madone's medals marnie mcbeans and i always was like in such awe just thinking like wow olympic medals are they're heavy like they weigh a lot and it's a but it's more about the story behind the medal that is meaningful to me. That's awesome. And um, good, good to know that it's under lockdown too. So no one can, uh, can get to them, but yeah, um, I've been fortunate enough, like on my level where from a special Olympics perspective, I've been able to go and talk to like public schools and I brought my national medal and obviously it's nowhere near an Olympic medal, but that, again that that story behind it and and being able to share your experiences with the younger generation is something that's definitely a priceless memory that you'll carry onward and and you'll have an uh enjoyment or excitement to do so right Mm -hmm. now we had a fan question come in asking what's the scariest or most intimidating discipline and also are you fearless (laughs) (laughs) no i am not fearless 
I, uh, I think that I build courage through repetition. So I'm going to tell you a story about this element that I learned on the horizontal bar. It was okay. called a def, D-E-F, but you could mistake it for the word death because you do a backflip with a one and a half twist, 15 feet above the ground, and then you have to grab this little metal bar at the end of it. So when I was learning that element, it was suggested to me by a Russian coach who had come in as my coach's mentor. He was with us on a training stint for three months. And he said, Kyle, this is the move for you. You have great air awareness. You can do it. And you just have to build up your courage. And so the first, when he suggested it to me, I said, there is no way I am doing that. Absolutely no way. I can't do that skill. And he's like, you just have to try. So I did the first one and I pitched it out about eight feet away from the bar. I was not anywhere near close to catching it. And then he said, okay, you got the first one done. Now start bringing it in closer. So slowly but surely over the course of three months, every single day, I got up on that high bar and I did my giant and I did the element and I had a coach throwing a mat onto the bar to keep me safe and protected. And slowly I built up the courage. And I got closer and closer to that bar and I started to understand where my body was in the air and I started to become a little less fearful and more fearless. And one day I just kicked my toes up just at the right angle. I did the one and a half twist. I saw the bar and I reached and my coach didn't throw the mat in and I grabbed it and I caught the bar. And in that moment as an athlete, I filled with all of the emotions. I was like shaking out of fear. I was shaking out of excitement. I was hollering that I caught it. The coach grabbed me by my cheeks and he was like, see, you can do it. You can do it. You didn't think you could, but you did. And that's why sport is so magical because sport, if you are persistent and you show up and you find a little more courage each day, you can really make huge strides and, and gains, but you have to trust yourself and you have to give yourself that time. I think our world is doing us a disservice by showing us that you can be Instagram famous and then it's everything's instantly at your fingertips. You can order a meal and it can be at your house in 30 minutes. Really meaningful things take time. You know that from Special Olympics. You yeah. have to show up and you have to do the work. So I am not fearless, but with persistence, I become more courageous. That's fantastic. And um, I, yeah, you yeah. We'll move on to the next question because I don't know how I really add to that because that's it's so true. Like you have to put in the work and dedication, and and it all pays off in the end. Plain now, and simple. I want to move from sport to the movie field for a second. So in two thousand five, uh, you played a character named Kelly Mandrak in the Hungarian made film White Palms. How did that movie kind of come to be, and how did uh, how did that kind of get started? When you mention it, my, a big smile comes across my face. So I had an assistant coach. Manjack was my, my coach for my entire career until I was, until Athens. And then I had a different coach, uh, Tony Smith, for the last part of my career. But um, Uldi was this Hungarian guy. And he, we met him at a competition in Hungary in 1992 six and then we kept in touch with oldie and he came to calgary and he became kelly's assistant coach so oldie and i developed a very strong friendship and rapport and his brother is a movie director in hungary a very famous movie director there and they wrote this script and the movie was called white palms is how you translate it to english like chalky hands and so they wrote the script and they got funding and then they started filming the movie and they asked me if i wanted to play one of the lead characters. I'm not an actor. I've never taken acting classes. I don't know if my acting ability is very strong, but they did an audition and they gave me the part. And so I played this, this character. Now the character's name was Kyle and it was supposed to be a different name, but Oldie kept calling me Kyle on set when we were filming. And so they're like, okay, well, Kyle's gonna be your name because we've got all this footage with him calling you Kyle. And then we were like, well, why don't we make the last name Manjack? Because Kelly Manjack was my coach and I love him and he's an amazing man. So <laughs> Kyle Manjack is the character. And essentially I was a gymnast that had 
a lot of teenage angst and was having a hard time listening to his coach. And it's kind of true to real life. Kelly and I didn't always see eye to eye, but Uldi was there to help me through that challenging time in my developmental years. And so the movie is loosely based on real life. Uldi in Hungary was a young gymnast and he experienced um, a lot of abuse actually from his coach. Um, his coach would like hit them. He'd make them go into a little ball and he'd put a milk crate over them and sit for hours if they were being misbehaved. It was a highly abusive environment, but it was a, a part of a communist regime. And so not that that's an excuse, but that's kind of the way that it was at the time. And so in the movie, Uldi comes to Canada and he ends up hitting a child. And then um, instead of sending him back to Hungary, they assign him to help this troubled teen athlete um, find his ground and find his Olympic path. And so we end up competing against each other in the movie at the world championships head to head. And um, that never happened in real life, but we filmed those scenes in Budapest and it was a really, it was a really great experience. And I feel so happy that I was able to help Oldie and his brother make their dream become a reality because Oldie played a really big role in my gymnastics career and helping me reach the, the level of achievement that I was able to as well. That's really cool. And, and when you talk about Oldie and, and, and Kelly and, and your coaches, um, one of my questions near the end, but I'll ask it now, where there, there's a lot of people that have mentors or have those individuals in their lives that help them with pushing towards their, their careers and, and kind of getting them to the next step. Is, would you say, I guess, those would be your two top uh, people that were like your biggest mentors in life or who else would you want to include in that? Yeah, so Kelly, Kelly Manjak, was, he's definitely one of my biggest mentors. I still have a great relationship with him. We talk once a week at least. Um, he, he really set a great example for me that you can reach a high level of success in sport in a healthy, happy, holistic way. He never pushed me. He motivated me. He held me accountable, but he never made me feel like I wasn't worthwhile if I didn't achieve the results. He allowed me to grow. He allowed me to be independent. He allowed me to really take ownership of my goals and my dreams. And he was there as a supporter. So he is someone that I look to as a, a huge mentor in my life. And then there's just so many people. When I close my eyes, I go through the film strip. Like I get the flash of all the faces. I had hundreds of athletes that I inspired me, but two really stand out. Jennifer Wood was the first Albertan to ever qualify to the Olympic Games for gymnastics. And she trained at the same club that I did. It was the Altador Gymnastics Club. And so I was a young boy watching her chase her Olympic dream. And to see her achieve it and to know that she went to the same place I did every single day in order to try to get um, to accomplish her goals, that really sparked something inside of me. If she could, why couldn't I? And then Mark Tewksbury does play a really big role in, in my um, childhood motivation for sport because he was from Calgary and he went on to win an Olympic gold medal and I saw him speak um, when I was a student at school and it just it conjured up motivation inside of me and his stories after the games in Barcelona where he says like he laid in bed and had a nap and he was thinking about the race and he just thought to himself well there's eight guys in this final why can't I win I had that same moment in 2004. I was laying in my bed, having my afternoon nap before the final in the evening, and I was laying there making myself feel <laughs> like crazy and nervous. And then I thought, there's eight guys in this final. Like, I've proven I could be one of the best. Why can't I do this? Like, I can do this. I need to be adaptable. I don't need to be perfect. I just need to nail my routine to the best of my ability, and I could win. So Jennifer Wood, Mark Tewksbury, and Kelly Manjack, I would say, are the three people that really like um, impacted my life in terms of my belief in my ability to actually achieve the big goals that I had for myself. That's awesome. And talking about those big goals and, and 2008 in Beijing, you reached the Olympic Games for a third time. What was it like to be able to represent Canada on the biggest sports stage uh, for a third time and, and show your – and like? And yeah, just be, be there. So 2008 was 
a very meaningful and special Olympic experience for me. The first games I had in 2000 in Sydney were my experience Olympics. 2004 was the dream Olympics. And 2008 was the comeback Olympics. I had broken my legs 11 months before those games. And I committed with every ounce of my being to making it back to those games, to represent Canada, to be a part of the team. I did want to make a final and win another medal. And I used that as my motivation and the magnetic pull along the way. That didn't become a reality but I felt so proud to be standing there competing for a third time at a third Olympic games, knowing that I had overcome the biggest obstacle in my athletic career and I had done it with integrity and I had done it with positivity. And that felt so amazing to be able to stand there and and represent Canada for a final time, um, knowing that I had overcome this huge hurdle in my, in my career. That's so cool. And, and, Kudos to you, because uh, like come, overcoming injuries is one one thing, but to to break your legs, and then especially in a sport like uh, people that are like hockey players, they break their arm. It's like okay, like that's fine. I can play if it's I break my left arm, I can still shoot with my right and things like that. But like you literally need your legs in gymnastics, and so right. um, that and it's I really have an admiration for you on how you've you've kind of labeled each Olympics. Like the the setup, the the Dream Olympics and the comeback, um, because that's that's like a storybook right there. So if you know if your friends in the Hungarian movie industry need another movie, I think that could be a movie story right there. Well, at the 2008 Olympics as well, I I learned a really important lesson that I think I take with me, and and in some weird way, I feel like the universe needed me to learn this. I placed so much value after the 2004 Olympics on like Olympic medals and winning the medals and the sponsorship and all that kind of stuff like that, that did become a priority. And I think it does for a lot of athletes, but when I broke both of my legs, it all kind of went in front of my face. It's like, this can be taken away from you really quick. And so I had a greater appreciation for it. And at those 2008 Olympics, after I was done competing, I was, I was disappointed that I didn't move forward to the finals. But when I did my gut check, like when I had to check in with myself, I felt like I was successful. And that was the big lesson I think I was meant to learn from that, was that success isn't just about medals. That is one way of achieving success, but success is an inner sense of self-satisfaction in knowing that you did everything you could to be the best you were capable of becoming. And i felt that at the Olympics in 2008. When I was done competing, I was I felt that sense of success. And it was, you, you just can't, you can't quantify it. You can't measure it. It's something that's inside. And I felt it. That's so, yeah. Honestly, man, that's, I'm so humbled to hear your story and your journey. And I'm glad we're able to share this with our, with my viewers and, and with the show. Um, and, and talking about those experiences and those moments, um, my last question for you is just for the next generation of athletes that want to get into gymnastics, want to get to that Olympic level, or just even to pursue their, their dreams and win a, get those experiences over medals. Um, what kind of um, words of wisdom would you rather, or would I like to say, um, would you like to give to those next generation of athletes? And that's a loaded question. There's, there's so many things I would want to say, but at the end of it, I would say, make sure you're the one who's driving the bus. Make sure it's your dream. Make sure it's your goal. And make sure to thank all of the people that are there helping you and supporting you. Um, but at the end of the day, the only athletes that truly achieve a sense of satisfaction in their performances and that have success and that do win gold medals at the Olympics or a special Olympics are the athletes that are in charge and take ownership of their, their own success. So it's, it takes a village, but at the end of the day, it's, it's you who's at the center of that. And you have to be the one who's like holding that steering wheel, looking forward and chasing your goal. Words of wisdom, the great Cal she felt. Thank you, sir, for taking the time to be on the show, talk about your experiences, your careers, and so much more. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. We'll talk to you again soon. That sounds amazing. All right. Bye. Bye. All right.
right, everyone, that was Kyle Schufelt, uh, three-time Olympic gymnast. Uh, thank you to Kyle for being on the show, and thank you to everyone again for watching uh, what was the first episode of 2021, and we look forward to having you tune in to many more episodes throughout the year. Uh, until next time, take care.